Hello, everybody. Can you hear me? And now, uh, can everybody see my screen? Cool. Um, hi, everybody. My name is Vidya. I am a machine learning engineering manager at Spotify, and I lead the personalization efforts for voice. I'm very excited uh, to be here today and present some of our work on Place Spotify and share it with you all. So uh, I guess let's get started. Let's get started with some numbers. Spotify is the world's largest audio streaming platform. We have over 299 million monthly active users, and we are available in 92 different markets. Our catalog has over 60 million tracks, 4 billion playlists, the latest entry being 1.5 million podcast titles. So hopefully these numbers will provide you a good context around the scale at which we'll be talking through the rest of this presentation. Personalization. So personalization, recommendations and personalization is very core and an integral part of users' experience on Spotify. To that effect, you may have already seen a lot of different um, features in this space. I'm going to highlight a few of them today. Um, we'll start with Discover, which was a legacy page for recommendations where our users used to go and find recommendations. We moved further um, and built out um, some of our flagship features, such as Discover Weekly Release Radar. And today um, we have over a dozen different playlists, which are recommendations of different flavors um, generated and made available to our users. Additionally, personalization is also available in a bunch of other product features, just to highlight a few. It's available in our search experience, which is completely personalized. As you can see, I just hit, this is a screenshot from my search page. As you can see, I've just hit the alphabet K. It's automatically popping up with some top results based on what it knows about me as a user, and my listening behavior on Spotify. And then there's recommended songs, which is this footer that you probably would have seen in uh, playlist pages, just basically a bunch of track recommendations that we think could go probably very well with the playlist the user is curating. And home, which is basically a landing page experience, which is completely personalized for our users. So that said, there's a lot of personalization and recommendation features that are built and shipped to our users already, and it's appreciated by a lot of users. But for today's talk, I'm going to be focusing on voice. How does Spotify build and support voice capabilities? And then we'll switch gears and talk about bringing personalization to the voice experiences. And finally, I'll conclude my talk by sharing some of our challenges and future work. So let's get going. Uh, get started with this recorded demo. You'll hear my colleague Aaron requesting some music um, on voice now. Play music. Sure, music on Spotify. Here you go. <laughs> So um, as you can see, this experience is primarily based on two interactions. One, that the user initiates the interaction by speaking to the system and asking for content. And the second interaction being listening, where the user listens to the content provided thereafter. So both speak or talking to the system and listening is a very integral and primary point of interaction to the voice experience. With that said, let's now talk about some of the services in which voice is available. Voice is available on a bunch of smart speakers, including Google Home and Alexa, as well as voice assistants, which is Siri, Alexa, Google Assistant, Cortana, and our very own now voice available on mobile services for Spotify. So now that we've spoken about like what the voice experience itself is and where they're available. Um, like I mentioned, it's initiated by the users. And so let's not talk about the user utterance type or about the, the nature of queries that the user usually uses to initiate these sessions. I like to think of it as a slider, which goes anywhere from specific to super ambiguous. So at the specific end of the spectrum is what we internally call as entity search. Examples of these include things like Play me Adele or play me hello by Adele. And the user is like super specific about the content they want. And our job is pretty well done if we're able to retrieve and return the content to users. So slide further, uh, we get what we call as descriptive internally. 
Examples of um, actresses in this space include play me workout music, play me sleep time music, or play me some meditation music. So clearly the user is very specific about the kind of music that they want, but there isn't literally one content in our catalog which ma maps to it. So what this means is this is a case where there could be multiple accurate results, and the opportunity here is to identify the most relevant of those and return it to our users. And finally, at the ambiguous end of the spectrum is what we call as open-ended or internally as omaka say use cases, where the user basically says things like play music, play Spotify, play something good, right? So sure, the user is making an utterance, but it's not truly, the query is not truly um, informative in terms of what exactly the user wants. So this is a classic example of like ambiguous query and the opportunity here is to convert these into engaging user sessions thereafter. And in order to do that, we leverage what we already know about our users via our recommendation systems. So now let's look at this plot of our trends trend. I think uh, this is from a week before Halloween. And I really like this plot because it's a good representation of some of the trending utterances and it also represents all the different natures of uh, queries or utterance types that I just explained in the slide before. It's also pretty interesting to see that um, users are already asking for Christmas music. Um, so now let's just formalize, summarize and formalize the paradigm based on what we've seen so far around the ecosystem of voice. To begin with, it is basically primarily an audio to audio system. What this means is there's an audio input into a system when the user speaks or talks to a system. And then there's an audio output when, the, when we return back with content, which gets played and the user is able to listen to it. So it's basically an audio to audio system primarily. So what this also means then is the primary surface, hence, is basically zero GUI. There's no graphical user interface or no visual real estate available. So this, uh, this actually introduces a bunch of very interesting challenges from a personalization standpoint. And then the user initiates a session, and typically it's natural language. So as you may expect, there's a lot of unstructured queries. And sometimes users basically say literally anything and everything and hope to be impressed. So here are some examples. So we do see users asking for things like play songs that sound like Madonna, but are jazz or play something sick. What does this even mean? Um, is this a case when our users are actually feeling sick and they want some music to soothe them? Or is this more like sick as in the slang sick? So um, this again introduces, as understandable, um, some very interesting challenges. And we do want to keep the experience, the voice experience primarily as close to a real world interaction. It has to be a very seamless and friction-free experience for our users to prefer and use voice as opposed to any other ways in which they can interact with Spotify. And finally, it basically brings us down to the machine learning problem of optimizing for precision at one. So um, it is extremely important to get the first content right on voice surfaces because there's no visual real estate, there's no way for our users to see what's the content that is gonna come there after. So it's so much more important now to get like the first content, first content returned right, so that we can build trust with our users. That's basically to summarize the paradigm in which we are operating. And so now let's look at the system underlying system. What I'm going to present is a highly abstracted overview of our tech stack. So we'll start with the users interacting. So display commands displayed here, but there are also other types of commands such as like increase volume, decrease volume, or like add the sum to my playlist, say with um, bandwidth artists, so on and so forth. Um, and so that's basically the first entry point. And this audio utterance feeds into our ASR systems, which converts it into text, which then feeds into our energy system, at which point we do intent and slot detection, which then feeds into our fulfillment system, basically fulfillment manager, which determines based on the incoming query uh, as to what is the content that needs to be retrieved? And if there's more than one, the opportunity to personalize and return the most relevant uh, play URI, which then goes back to our users and hopefully translates into a delightful experience. Let's now go through an end-to-end -end overview of a use case. So let's pretend our user says something like play for Clover by um, Taylor Swift. 
This first feed feeds into the ASR system, at which point it's transcripted and available in text after some post-processing, which then feeds into the NLU system, at which point we do two things, intent detection, which is like, is this a play intent, and so what kind of play is it? And then slot detection, at which point we try to identify the entity that the user is looking for. In this case, it happens to be artists and a particular album of the artist. And this information feeds into our fulfillment manager, which then performs the retrieval and returns the same to our users via the client. So um, this is just an end-to-end -end overview of a specific use case, and there are a lot of interesting problems and also interesting machine learning problems at each component of this entire tech step. And so let's talk about a few of them. Let's start with ASR. We do have queries like play YouTube. Um, so how do we transcribe this? Is this U2 as such the artist or is this U and um, the number two transcribe? So there's like lots of different gradients and how do we determine which is the right one? Um, and then another example is like, that's at the ASR end. If you move further and think about like uh, the fulfillment component, there's opportunities at like play smooth. Um, what do the users want? Do they want the track lead to smooth? Or, they, or do they want more like smooth music, as in like some smooth jazz music? Or my favorite example is this play work from home, which is pretty interesting because this has challenges and opportunities right from like the NLU level. So do we have to like intent and slot detect this as play a track work by Rihanna from your home device? Or is it a case where the user wants to play an entity with a name work from home, at which point we still have three different options because there's a work from home track, there's a work from home album, and um, right now we have tons and tons of playlists with titles work from home. So uh, this is just to kind of like expose you guys to some of the interesting problems that exist. But for the rest of this presentation, I'm going to be focusing on bringing personalization specifically to the last component, which is the fulfillment system. Let's go through the utterance, example, uh, utterance types and walk through an example each for um, each one of these so we get a good understanding of what exactly is the opportunity and how we can apply personalization. So let's say the user says, play me Taylor Swift. Up until end of 2019, we used to always return the artist URI or like a specific content of the artist, which is representative of the artist's work um, as the return result. But if the user were to perform the same query on another surface like our search, because there's visual real estate, we are able to render more than one return result, and the user is able to pick and choose whichever appeals the most to them. So this basically exposes this opportunity of like there is no one size that fits all. And different users may want different types of content, ranging from familiar to the discovery to like what is the most recent release of this artist. And that expectation could possibly change even for a given user across like different artists. And at Spotify, we have different play contexts ranging from like playlists to albums to radio and so on and so forth. So the opportunity at any given point is amongst the combination of different content hypotheses and context, how do we pick and choose the most relevant result for any given user at any given point? So we've had some success with using contextual multi-arm bandits for this use case, um, where we basically treat each one of the strategically different fulfillment strategy as an arm. And then we train models based on log interaction data to kind of like determine the best of the arms for the user at any given point using contextual signals. And this is deployed and perfected through the explore component of multi-arm bandit, and we use the explore for explorations of the new content as well as collecting unbiased training data. Now let's go over an example with Descriptive. Um, a good example here is Play Me Workout Music. So it's a lot of workout music content available in Spotify, as you can see from the screenshot. Um, but then again, uh, the opportunity here is these are all accurate results. But how do we determine which is the most relevant result for any given user at any given point is the personalization opportunity. And if we were to employ signals and features, such as what we know about the users, the items, the user item interaction from historical data, such as like using affinity and embedding representations of users and items, 
you'll be easily able to determine amongst all of these accurate candidates. The checkbox ones are what is most relevant for me as a user. And then it's a matter of like rank list and return the best to the top one to the user. And finally, the open-ended mindset case of play music. When the user basically says things like play Spotify, play music, play something good. Um, so here is the ambiguous use case. And like I mentioned already, the way we go about addressing this is by leveraging what we already know about our users via our recommendation systems. Spotify already has a bunch of different flavors of recommendation ranging from familiar to the discovery to even action based based on your likes and streams and so on and so forth. So the problem now gets reduced to a stacked architecture where you have a layer of candidate generation where we can prefill with either any of our existing recommendation candidates or generate new ones. So that's the level one. And then we have a personalized ranker that sits on top of it using different features such as item use, or contextual and event feedback to make the decision on the fly at any given point and any given context for the user. So with that, I'm going to share um, some of our recent A-B test, successful A-B test results here, um, just to give an end-to-end -end perspective. And so what you see here is screenshots from one of our recent experimentation, a very basic epsilon video approach, um, where we trained um, two models, um, boosted trees and log red, and we A-B tested them just to determine um, impact. And what you see here is with respect to impact or metrics with respect to session length. And the plot on the left bottom indicates, here yeah, there's been a significant improvement or lift in metrics with respect to our control. The plot on the right actually indicates how it was achieved. It was basically achieved by shifting the center of density from um, further right, which means that by increasing the time across the like, majority of our user sessions, we were able to achieve an overall improvement in the entire session length. So that's just to call out some of our wins in the space. But certainly we have a lot of open challenges. To begin with, we go over metrics. Um, with metrics, I mean, it, it is a challenge in recommendation and personalization in general. But working on voice, it kind of like exposes some very interesting challenges in terms of like offline metrics, online metrics, offline, online correlation and even interpretation of online metrics um, for experimentation. So I'll give you a quick example here. Um, there is a metric around like utterance count or utterance rate, but it's not always good for that utterance rate to go up because it could also happen when the users are performing a lot of reformulation of queries, which is actually a sign of frustration. So this is a very simple example that we uncovered a while ago, and we actually today have a frustration metric just to track that for our users and be able to interpret metrics in a wholesome fashion and identify that to um, potential user experiences so that we can tie it back into our models in terms of what we are optimizing for. And then there are ASR errors. Um, I think we spoke about a few already, uh, with examples like play YouTube or like play grades. G-R-E-Y or with a G-R-A-Y. But I think there are also like challenges here, not just at language level, but also at like accent and dialect levels. Um, a favorite example of mine for this is um, for the use case when our users with British accent ask for like Indian music, it actually sometimes gets transcribed as um, the Indian language Hindi music. And clearly that is not going to be a good uh, fulfillment experience for our user should we return that content. So we have some interesting challenges at ASR as well. And then going back to the no visual, how do we guide our users? How do we provide good context to the users as to why they get what they get and how are ways in which they can get new content or access content? There's efforts around guidance, but then we want to make sure that there's a good balance between good guidance and keeping the entire experience friction free. And the other challenge, it's not a huge challenge, but then we do have third party integrations for smart speakers and other assistants. And on these portals, we don't necessarily completely control the end to end experience. So that's again a very interesting problem. And like we're looking into ways in which we can address it and make the experience good for our users, maybe Spotify and those services. 
And then finally, uh, this certainly challenge around educating our users about all the functionalities and capabilities that are available and exist and how they can tap into it. Um, so yeah, these are some of the challenges and we're working on some of these, but they are hard enough and um, you know, we continue to invest in these spaces and look into smart, interesting ways in which we can address these. And finally, I wanna talk about some of the future work, particularly in the machine learning space. Again, we work on some of these and continue to invest in these going into the future, such as contextual, how, how can we make the entire experience, experience contextual, real time, and reactive? Um, efforts around energy and TTS, making the whole interaction multi term with a, almost like a dialogue like experience, and then move beyond just English languages and cold start for both users as well as content. So, with that, I want to take a moment. Um, recognize my team. These are the actual people behind all the cool work that I just presented so far. Um, and with that, I'll open it up for any questions and thoughts here. And I want to thank you all for your time and attention. I think there's a question here, but how do I see what the question is? Oh, I didn't see the questions and I don't know if I'm running out of time. All right, I'm going to read out a few questions here and see um, if I can answer them. All right, um, first one, let's see here. It's from Shagler. How is the personal stranker that is used in this particular application different from many other personal strankers that Spotify uses across the product? Um, did you run any application study to understand what features matter most in this case? This is a great question. Um, yeah, we have a lot of different personalized rankers across like different surfaces. Um, but I think this talk highlights in terms of capabilities that were required for voice, which is not necessarily very important in other use cases, include the whole tapping into the whole interactive nature. Because the voice experience is interactive, it is so much more important to incorporate user feedback. So just like we return a content, the user says like, I don't want any more of this artist. You should be able to incorporate that into content return thereafter. So I would say the main differentiators from other rankers include, you know, features in more the contextual space around like what, what kind of queries, what kind of content the user consumed before the specific query and like any feedback on the fly and how we can kind of incorporate that in real time and reactive fashion. So that is that. And then I'm gonna do one more question because I think I'm running over time. Um, this is from Shark Energy. Can you give us some sense of what kind of volume of users you see for this voice? Based interaction. And where uh, this is going. I think, um, unfortunately, I cannot disclose the numbers, but I can say this much that I think uh, the speakers, the smart speakers, is where uh, maximum traction is. And the majority of the traffic actually comes from speakers. Let's see, this is another follow up question. 
how do you collect any feedback about whether the recommendation is good or not? Mostly interested in how do you think about negative samples? Yeah, I think this is a great question. Um, I think you've been exploring and uh, trying to find different ways in which we can collect feedback. Um, we've played around with actual polls on our mobile surfaces just to collect from users explicit feedback, asking them, hey, how is this experience? Did it kind of like line up with your expectations? Um, was this a good recommendation or not? So we actually do collect explicit feedback, but it certainly is. Um, not in line with keeping the experience friction free, but it's interesting um, observation that users are actually open to provide feedback in order to make things better for us. So that's definitely one way. Uh, but we also have like other implicit signals that we're able to integrate, particularly in the space of negative samples that we're able to use. All right, let me check to see if I can take more questions. Hello, everyone. We will now be breaking for lunch and we'll be returning at 1245. Again, thank you so much for attending ML Conference. We will see you all back live at 1245. Thank you very much.